And today we have a special guest, Jake King from CMD. And what you're going to find out is why CMD is growing real fast and is on Forbes top 20 list and a lot of different exciting things besides the fact that he might be from Australia and besides the fact that he might be living in British Columbia, but who cares? But we're going to get into this, but first let's start off with Chris. Talk about your beer that you have with us today. All right. Who's starting? Chris. Uh, all right. I, I like, I, like, I'm like everything I bring. I'm going to try a wheat IPA. Um, love wins. I think the can is awesome. I think as I, I, I do my Costco shot. Costco now has a local section, which so this is yet another local and, and I can't go with less than 16 ounces. So this is 16 ounces of that. And then my backup is my another lightning Creek instead of nuclear nectar. We've got the uh, 2020 there. So uh, we're going to try that sucker out and it should be, if, if I make it to the end of this show, I hopefully still am in a more <laughs> vertical position. All right, Jeremy, <laughs> tell us what you brought today. All right, I got two, like everybody. I got the primary, <laughs> which is the, uh, this is the Deschutes Brewery. It's called the uh, Fresh Squeezed IPA, my 16-ouncer. Really get the uh, motor running. Then my backup is a uh, Hot Valley uh, Bubble Stash. Nice. The nice, nice. crisp uh, IPA. So, so Jake, what you got, Jake? Tell us what you got. 33, 33 acres of Nirvana for the primary. Another IPA. A uh, bit of an IPA fan, and this is a strong IPA. So it's it comes in at seven percent. Nice. Uh, 70 IBU, which I'm uh, I'm a little bit excited about, um, and the the, dis the disaster recovery plan is the uh, Graffiti West Coast IPA. Uh, so excited to try this one. This one's from Parkside Brewery, uh, Vancouver based uh, for both of them. So nice. hopefully nice. can find them online. And and today I'm bringing Dale's Pale Ale, which happens to be a local Austin, Texas brewery. And uh, for a backup plan, listen, I'm going to stick to my good old Bud Light if I need to. <laughs> there's a plug for big <laughs> there you go so welcome uh, to the show jake we really uh, appreciate having you here if you don't mind tell us a little bit about yourself uh, why uh, that you co-founded uh, cmd and uh, then we'll get into some questions I, I have a few i know chris and uh, jeremy do as well i'd love to hear yeah. from yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I'll, I think, uh, you know, my career in security started like many of us, um, kind of tearing things apart and figuring out how they work. Um, you know, in FOSEC specifically, uh, with, with wanting to understand how a system operates, wanting to, to, to find ways to, to maybe make it do things that it shouldn't be doing is, is always part of my nature. And I think as I, as I kind of grew up and, and, and edged towards technology, I, I started my career in, in, in network administration, did some forensic work and, and really loved it. And, I uh, found myself uh, a number of years later and, and many, many pen tests later uh, working for a company called Hootsuite in Vancouver, uh, where I actually mm -hmm. met my co-founder, uh, Maloon, uh, Maloon Tesovic, who's uh, a bit of a, a bit of a well-known entrepreneur here in Vancouver and uh, had had some successful uh, operations in the past. I'd, uh, I kind of started talking with him uh, about a number of the challenges that, that, that he was kind of going through with, with Linux observability and Linux security. I think he, he'd approach the problem in a really, a really pragmatic way. And, and I kind of came at it from a bit of a, you know, a security twist, which is why wouldn't I just bolt 50,000 together and do it myself? But, uh, <laughs> you know, I think the two of us really kind of uh, found a way to make something pretty awesome and, and, and uh, we're a couple of years down the road and, and growing pretty quickly and rapidly. And I will say being a, being a security vendor is really different than kind of hacking it all together. It's uh, it's nice for change. <laughs> that, that's awesome. So, yeah. so, as we look at the, the CMD product line, and, and I'm gonna speak really from a simplified perspective and, and use an analogy. I look at some of the stuff that you do with credentials for access management and logins and things like that. And then on the other yeah. side of the fence, I look at the Microsoft world, right, with Active Directory <coughs> and the Azure stuff. Is there a similarity between what you're doing in the Unix Linux environment and then with that Microsoft Active Directory type solution? Yeah, I think for, for, for a long time, um, and look, we're, we're all practitioners here. I, I think that the most interesting thing that I've found of being a security practitioner is we, we try to relate everything to some, right? Centralize it, make it consistent. You know, Jeremy, you've, you've lived, 
years of this. And, 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 you know, I think that it, it, Chris, you probably the same. I, I, look, there is, there is a thousand and one ways that a system can go wrong and centralized identity was, was, was foundational to Microsoft. It was foundational to the way we build our endpoints. Um, and, and for the last, you know, 20 years, it's been super consistent. We've, we've been able to minimize coverage and, and uh, sorry, minimize risk and, and maximize coverage and, and get things really consistent. Look for the Linux and Unix, there was really strong, you know, kind of user based or, you know, credential based grouping based, you know, principles in its operation. But we, at some point in the last, you know, kind of 20, 30 years kind of lost our way a little bit and, and started to use config management and other systems to kind of centralize. And I, I think in a lot of ways, it just came out of the fact that we, we want to get stuff working. Uh, it's just got to work. And so it was about getting it up quickly, making it work quickly. And then we kind of threw it over the devs to, to figure it out. And I think, the, you know, the, 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 the Unix and Linux landscape specifically compared to the Microsoft landscape is, is just one of a bit of disorganization, but it, it just comes from, you know, unfortunately just a bit of a natural progression of how these systems have been rolled out and 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 really how these systems have changed so much in the last like 20 years i i I, i'd hazard a guess that every one of us has dealt with some crazy uh crazy challenges around identity uh, or attribution um and now with the cloud involved it's like it's way easier to get something deployed out much faster and much more i guess much more innocuous when it uh goes kind of horribly wrong yeah now we were we were just talking recently to uh, somebody that uh, they've got an entire Linux farm with their electronic management records or medical records on board, right? So that talks yeah. about security probably at the highest level right there in terms of need. Yeah, it's, um, I, you know, I think it's really drastically changed. Uh, you know, I, I'm probably not the first one to say this, but there's not much on the computer in front of me right now. Uh, everything's in Google Drive or, you know, Azure in Docs or in OneDrive somewhere or in Box. And, and I think even with our email clients and all of the things in between, we've, we've, we've centralized a lot of these systems. And, and in turn, the, the risk profile has changed for adversaries. I mean, I'm not popping people's endpoints and trying to find, you know, super secret financial documents in the documents folder. I'm popping the system and looking in the downloads folder for the stuff that's been left on the system that they've forgotten about. I think that kind of ephemeral nature of, information on the endpoints that we use has really forced adversaries to look at different places to, to see where they can find items of value. Uh, and the cloud is just one of those points of value. Um, Linux is intrinsically kind of where the majority of the data that we store every day is, is going to sit. And it's, uh, it's certainly been interesting to kind of, I guess, eye opening to see how immature some of this, uh, some of this infrastructure actually is. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. Go ahead. So let's see, uh, give our audience an overview of CMD. What yeah. is your product actually do? And what, what's, what marketplace does it address or what security issues does it address? Yeah, we, we kind of started from this principle that, you know, there was no real signature flagship, you know, kind of principle design for, for securing a Linux cloud fleet. And it, and, it, and it really kind of came out of the fact that we've all built very different, very drastically different Linux environments, but they're also very heterogeneous. They, they change over time. We acquire companies, we bring in new developers, we introduce new systems or deployment mechanisms. And fundamentally, what's at least started to happen with, you know, in the last you know, couple of years is, is we've, we've started to see things diverge really rapidly. So CMD was built to solve two really critical issues for companies that were struggling with those problems, really getting consistency around observability, right? Number one is like, know your landscape, know the adversaries, know what your systems are actually doing. And every time I would speak to uh, an administrator in a big company, I'd say, Hey, where are you centralizing all your logs? Or how are you looking at different uh, mechanisms to, you know, monitor failed logins or, or an unusual activity. And a lot of the time it was, so I've built 50 different layers of parsing methods and I'm using rsyslogd and a bunch of different forwarding tech to centralize something into Elasticsearch. And then I'm running queries on Elasticsearch and funneling that out and building some anomalies detection, blah, 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 blah. And it was this like 50, 50 or a 100 sentence answer to this really simple problem of like what's actually going on in prod. And the more I kind of dug into that problem with Maloon, we, the more we found out that look, consistency in audit D is just been, it's incoherent. It's, you know, syslog is enabled, but we turn it off and devs, you know, shut things down. And we just wanted to get an idea of what the hell people were doing. Um, 
And in a, in a lot of ways, we've been really pragmatic about it. We, we drop an agent on the system. We keep it super basic. You don't worry about the transport. You don't worry about the mechanisms. There's nothing to configure. You drop it in and we'll give you observability. Uh, and from that point, what we wanted to do is take all of the next few steps out of the way as well. So how can we learn from that observability and build a profile around the things that are risky to your environment? So we took this observability that's super consistent and super reliable, and we applied a logical set of controls to it, constraints. And rather than just simply saying, look, we're going to shut everyone's access down and delete that SSH key that everyone uses to get in a prod, we decided to make sure that it was, you know, kind of softer guardrails that we'd put in place. Because generally people want to do the right thing. Uh, the adversary mm -hmm. is the outlier. Um, and so we wanted to take that kind of more mature step. And it's really where our product started to lead towards more recently. It's taking really consistent information about an environment, applying a set of policies to, to constrain the things that you should and shouldn't be doing and doing it in real time. Um, and just de-risking it. You know, it's, it's, it's not about kind of creating guardrails and saying no to everyone. It's about creating guardrails that can say, maybe, you know, the Canadian approach, uh, it'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so the craziness of it is you, you, you've taught, you brought up Elastic and you're talking Linux and, and even in the hacker community, right? Everybody yeah. loves open source and free source. And people would say Metasploit before they say Rapid7. Yeah. Or Poly before who knows what core insight. And so the question really is, is like, here you, how can I put it? You, what, what drove you to believe that you could actually sell something to Linux people? You give it away to them for free first. If you want to, <laughs> you want to, you want to play with it, feel free to. I think one of the biggest gaps for us was it's super easy to get to phase one, but phase two, phase three, phase four, security maturity and defense in depth becomes really tricky. And we always had this really simple approach at Hootsuite to enable our teams through security. We wanted to act like the brakes on the bike. I'm using my old CISOs analogy, but use the, you act like the brakes on the bike, Jake. Be really good at locking up when you need to, but let people ride really fast on their bike when they need to be moving fast. And I think the mentality that a lot of people have is open source tools are going to be great at it. We're going to get there. We're going to go for it. Um, but they're veiled in this kind of obscure services contract that you have to pull in. And if you want to do those advanced cool things, you're going to pay for something. I always felt that best in breed didn't need to necessarily be free completely. I think being, you know, having a unique value proposition is part of it, but anyone can play around with it. And, and I think the, the joy for me is getting people started that may not be as mature as those that might downloading the, um, you, you know, Brandon Gregg's exec snoop binary and forwarding it in with another custom tool to S3 to run the object, you know, kind of queries over with Redshift or something along those lines. It was about saying, how can I train that intermediate engineer, that security engineer that just wants to get some shit done on how to get that stuff done and, and, and making it a bit easier. Um, you, you know, there, there always has to be another angle. Um, and I think a lot of, security companies will focus on this either in one drastic way or the other. You've got the crowd strikes of the world where you pay for system support services and deep insights into the product. And it's all locked down and commercial versus CMD. You can just go online, sign up, have a play. And if it's not for you, that's cool. Cause it gives me product feedback that that builds really, you know, valuable relationships with the community. Um, and it does the right thing. I think it's, I, I think we've got to give something away, but I, I don't think it always needs to be free. Value has got to be value, right? They can pay the rent, right? <laughs> Someone does. I mean, I mean Ron Gula used to say uh, he loved, you know, he took over Nessus and, and I said, Ron, it must be awesome. He said, the problem is, is that when you give things away, you get cheap customers. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. you get customers that really don't want to pay for it yet. And at the same time, the importance of security is crazy, right? So you, you get these homebrew companies and I guess it's a good tactic to, to, to put, a free offering because you know these guys want to grab and integrate but like you said you're, you're more than just integrated you're already post integration right i mean yeah. in the linux world I, I can't stand another another pam module on my wife right? <laughs> <laughs> optional versus marked versus <laughs> is this going to absolutely blow up everything on my system because i'm setting a single line into a file card you do a kernel change and then you get to do a kernel debug and it's like oh this ain't safe and no, it, thanks. It, yeah. Linux world is, is a crazy ass world, right? And, and yeah. most people that are used to the Windows boxes, uh, they get what they get. I mean, I'm a, yeah. I'm an Apple person. I, I'm actually kind of looking forward to this ARM change, um, only just because you know risk is cool from the hackers. Yeah. End, right. Yeah. 
<laughs> and so, uh, but the, the changes in the Linux environment, I think there hasn't really been a huge change. There hasn't been, I mean, if you read like a lot of the, the press, I mean, they're, they're trying to mimic, the last version mimics Windows 10. There's another yeah. version that mimics Mac. And it's like, you know, from a server perspective, you know, I like to open, you're, you're in Vancouver, you, you've got um, open DNS, or open.dns, open uh, BSD. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so, and I don't know if anybody still uses that. What a sweet, simple Linux. It did everything you wanted to do without the bloat. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I know I was gonna I was gonna say I think just to add on to that a little bit, you know, Linux and Unix for for so many years has just become such a fundamental part of our existence, right? You know, every one of us are using a Linux box somewhere in our day, and I think the more we've just relied on these these fundamentals, the more that that the world has changed around Linux. It's just been really insane to see where it's gone. I'm I'm, I'm all uh, you know. I'm excited to see alternative architectures and different chipsets and different methodologies of using systems. But effectively, we're going to be using someone's kernel. It's going to be compiled in some particular way, doing some. Yeah, I just, the big fear of me with Linux is like if you take a look at the CSSP, which I can't stand that exam. I don't have yeah. one. Don't worry. Um, and, <laughs> and all the all the evaluations. That, I mean, people love to talk about how to secure Windows, mm. right? But when it comes to to, to Linux, uh, just run as root. Do it. You know, do a seven seven seven. You know. Change my stuff. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, and maybe Jer Jeremy could probably, could probably talk to this a little bit more, but like, look, I, I was a huge fan of the cookies that growing up. I read that story and thought, holy crap, adversaries printing out teletype kind of transcripts of sessions to systems and just like learning a lot about how adversaries are working. And I was, I was comparing it to attacks that we've actually seen in the last six to 12 months and thinking not much has really changed. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd love to say that the sophistication has to be there for the container escape using this entry point and that permission to chain this set of vulnerabilities to go and act on your objectives. But when a developer leaves a laptop on a train, your SSH keys are in there and no one uses encryption. And of course, every you know certificate system and management is just relied on the, relies on the fact that, hey, we trust the people that are on the box. Maybe they have <laughs> access to the box. So I just, it kinda, it's kind of scary. I think... From a maturity perspective, I mean, even even up to a couple of years ago, I, look, I, I was a I was a bug bounty guy for a long a long time, and 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 found awesome awesome interesting entry points and vulnerabilities and weaknesses. I I played a special amount of attention to SSRF and messing with different kind of cloud APIs back in the day. But I, the one thing that I always found was if I was actually going after this company, I probably wouldn't be doing anything this sophisticated. I'd be <laughs> Sending 30 phishing emails to people's, you know, in the, to people in the engineering team who receive far less training on, you know, kind of security awareness and yep. maybe targeted to stack overflow or a recruiting email, get them to do a coding assessment, maybe pull some keys. There's a thousand and one little things that would always add up to me as being an easier way in. Well, and I mean, it was look, interesting. the recent Twitter example, right? It was, it was phishing emails, they say, that, that got the inside credentials of the people that started the whole thing. I mean, yeah. let alone the fact that like devs are probably going to push up their, you know, SSH keys and dot files. And if GitHub didn't have our back a few years ago with some nice red X filters would probably be a lot further up the creek than we actually are today. But like, I mean, like <laughs> how quick is it now for us to scan the entire internet, find out a vulnerable endpoint because someone's using an old version of SSH or, you know, Grafana or some mm -hmm. other service and, and find an entry point. It, it's not, it's not, it's not rocket science. And I think we need to think of it that way. Um, I'd love it to be sophisticated adversaries, but you know, only cause I'm, I'm a forensics guy. I like that stuff. <laughs> I, you're a nerd. I, got <laughs> yeah. I, I really want to write a script that just grabs all the keys and finds out which ones don't have passwords. Oh, right. I, look, I, I, even, <laughs> even, even, even probably even simpler than that. Like how many password reuse attacks would actually work because someone's shipped that dev container or kind of base image mm -hmm. in vagrant I don't want to go that point in the last couple of years. You're getting into classified data. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go into uh, I think, MSG, <laughs> Patriot passwords. Yeah, <laughs> look, I, I think that the scary thing for me is like, look, when you look at real security fundamentals, we've never really gotten it right when it came to Linux. And it's not because anyone's trying insanely sophisticated things. It was that we spent so much time worrying about the endpoint. Then we figured out that the endpoint was a pretty big target area and we had a lot of adversaries attacking it. Why aren't we thinking of the cloud that way? I'm telling you the same amount of people are hitting that infrastructure than 
you know, are hitting your app, you know, your sure. Apple infrastructure, your Apple server. It's just, you're probably not seeing it. It's kind of terrifying. <laughs> no, you, you, we agree hundred percent. I mean, on our stuff, uh, one day I was kind of freaked out because we were looking at our, uh, our office 365 logs from right now. And like, you would think that attackers would go after the co-founders who would, no, Al was getting thousands upon thousands of people trying to break into his Office 365. Why? I can yeah. only guess LinkedIn. He's the most active <laughs> LinkedIn person I know. Yeah. And, 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 and they, they just pounding on him. But, but you're right. It's like people don't even look at the logs. Never mind. Like, so you set up this huge infrastructure. I'm really interested in the CMD stuff. So you set up this huge infrastructure, right? Now you start seeing this stuff. Yeah. And yeah. So what in the back end are you using? Are you using Elastic or did you, what did you do? Yeah, so we, we've, we've got a number of systems that we kind of offload. So it's actually a pretty sophisticated stack, but it's because what we do, and, and you're asking about value for us. Yeah. Value for us is if someone uses this thing as a honeypot or value for us is if someone uses this to test an exploit or play around with the system. We build a baseline of what normal is. We understand what abnormal is. And so right. we feed a lot of data into bucket storage engines um, because it keeps our, you know, our ability to query against massive sets of data really, really cheap. Uh, we use a lot of cloud services. We use things like BigQuery to analyze massive, massive amounts of data uh, in a pretty cost-effective way. And then we use traditional kind of databases for a lot of the, you know, kind of relational lookup storage stuff that you want to be able to look at. What's been really interesting for us is when you look at syslog and audit D data normally on a system, you can never compare it to your peers. But we're in a really interesting vantage point where we can look at both, you know, home gamers at home running CMD yeah. in their lab all the way up to some of the largest infrastructure providers in the world and, and, and some of the largest financial institutions in the world using CMD to kind of understand behavior of users. And we start to identify these micro patterns and macro patterns overall. And, and what's been super interesting is because the cost of the cloud is so insanely cheap compared to running, you know, ES on 50 nodes 10 years ago, right? You know, yeah. we're, we're able to do this stuff with, you know, bucket storage, simple, in, you know, engagement and query wow. languages and, and do some really cool stuff. I think what's been insanely valuable is like looking at things like, I don't know, we did a, a silly query on the data set a, a couple of years ago for our free cohort, um, Vim versus Emacs. Right. And we actually had the data behind it. And it was kind of cool to look at. Vim Vim one, right? Yeah, yeah, it, did. it absolutely did. But, you know, maybe, maybe oh, it's a bit of a VI. biased perspective. <laughs> well, VI, but, but you do VI, they alias it to Vim now. So you what's interesting, what's interesting <laughs> is we could probably tell you the most popular argument for VI or Vim and whether it's run as root more often than it's run as a specific user. I don't even know Emacs. I, I just know VI. <laughs> I learned that when it was VI. This is, my, this is the gold system five. This doesn't even run Linux. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I was, I was going to say, I was speaking to uh, a really good colleague and friend of mine who was uh, formerly the CI, a CISO at Hootsuite, but I, he was a security architect there at the time when I was working with him. And we work with each other really, really, you know, actually quite a lot. He literally wrote the book on Unix device drivers back in the day. Uh, George Fajari, for those that want to look him up. Um, he was a really awesome guy. And every time I would talk to him about Vim or VI, you know, he was the guy that we went to for like awesome regex one-liners and, you know, wicked kind of VI switches. But uh, myself and Pablo, the security engineers uh, working on the team, would always go to him to talk about the editor of choice. And he always said, Ed. <laughs> Ed, oh my so God, a, Ed, a funny oh, one. I was like, okay, here we go. <laughs> that's old that's, that's, uh, we're, we're that's, that's, re Al's, that's real power user. Al's life. We're always, Al, that was when you were in college. Was that <laughs> so shout out to George there for, uh, for teaching me how to, uh, to uh, maybe think VI is, is way better than Vim and, and, you know, look, I'm still not at the max level yet, but I, I know I'll eventually get there. there, there you, ever do, you ever do a more command, obviously? on, on uh, Yeah, le less, less is more, man. Less is more. So, so you know that little <laughs> colon? That little yeah. colon and the more? That's actually a VI colon. You can actually yeah, yeah. bang shell on it. So when somebody does a restricted shell, you can actually do it to a bang SH. And if not restricting the shell properly, you get a new shell. So this is actually a funny one. We see a lot of that, sh like shelling out of Vim is a really common obvious. Yeah. Thing. Oh God. It's something that I'd used for years. But you can do it. You can do it out of the more, and you can do it out of less. Also. Yeah. I think yeah. one of the coolest uh, like little command switches that I found inside of Vim, this was a couple of years ago. I think this was actually Patrick, who runs my ops team at CMD now. It's really uh, good. I'm pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure he told me about it, but it's uh, right quit pseudo t percent inside of Vim, 
will write the file as root back to the file if you get that permission denied error because you don't have write permissions to the file but you have read. It's really really handy until you blow away a you know like a. That's a interesting. Off. I gotta try it out now. I, I know what you're saying <laughs> because you're in the editor. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here we are supposed can... to be protecting people and we're giving away secrets, right? <laughs> hey, we're look, hey, we have a policy. We have a policy to defend against it. If you're using CMD, you've already got a catch for it. <laughs> <laughs> we're learning how to navigate the prompt. That's all we're learning. So right? we're, look, we're looking at the stuff we're all talking about anyway. <laughs> but, um, you know, you brought up all the stuff in Linux. I'm sorry, but you're going through all the old school stuff. You're, you're building all up. I mean, it, it, it's a crazy thing because I go back to this whole thing that that Linux guys, I mean, we're pretty cheap. I hate to say it, we're, we're cheap ass people. And so how has it been from a sales perspective? I got, Al's an awesome sales yeah. guy, we just don't know this. I mean, he's, <laughs> we call him the bulldog. He is so good at, at talking to people and listening to them. Yeah. He, he's got patience, he'll, he'll eat his pride. You know, as long as he gets his dog food, he, he tries hard. So yeah. you're, you're, <laughs> gro you're growing this company. Obviously you don't have an out because I've got them. I mean, how, <laughs> He's how got are you able to convince Linux people <laughs> to pay you? I mean, it's, yeah. it's it, it, because normally they don't have like the budget guys, the CEO and the CFO who goes partying with McAfee and Symantec and they spend mm. their money there. So yeah. why, how did, how do they wind up actually getting money away from the, the party people? Yeah. I, I and, think it's, and, it's, and to add to add to the question, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah. What what can they avoid? What can our listeners avoid purchasing in that other in those other tech stacks because of CMD to free I'll, up those monies? I'll, I'll, I'll maybe say it this way, but the, the person that the existing PAM solution vendor is taking out to dinner is is uh, is easily replaced by CMD. <laughs> no, uh, in all seriousness, I think I think uh, I, I think that uh, what we what we're finding, and it's it's a really good question, Chris. Um, None of us, none of us have budget, right? I was at Hootsuite. I, I was, I was figuring out IDS. I was, you know, looking at, uh, you know, Nessus for Vuln scanning, and I could only convince the team at the time to buy an on-prem license of Nessus Pro because I wanted to automate the hell out of the API and Nessus Cloud at the time, or I guess it's Tenablio now. Uh, was oh, way wow. too expensive for the for the um, for the crazy amount of infrastructure that I that I wanted to scan, and I think I think one of the things that switched on in my in my mind was can I demonstrate value in a way that kind of lets me level jump my career, right? So I always want to look like a rock star, right? And and I was the first security hire at the company, and so I'd find XSS and people were like, document cookie, that's terrifying. Uh, but when you start to kind of get beyond those kind of superficial vulnerabilities, and you've actually got to dig deep and try to build defense in depth, it got really tricky. And the way that I always looked at it was how do I multiply the force of myself? I trust myself, right? I trust um, my devs to get stuff shipped. And I was always able to convince them of buying something when they thought it was cool. So we made security cool. And for things like Nessus, we built an internal tool uh, called Cookie Monster uh, at Hootsuite, which would Vuln scan instances and pull uh, audit logs and get a whole bunch of information. Shout out Not to Pablo. We... virus, right? Not the <laughs> monster virus. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, the, <laughs> but I think that the most interesting thing about it was we, we try to make it cool. And, and, and getting buy-in from a dev team to roll something out that was actual commercial grade that wasn't going to blow up their stuff was way easier than, hey, guys, I duct tape and twined this pseudo as package and this audit D wrapper and a syslog forwarder and I've spun up this syslog instance that's writing to a bucket and it's only going to have 90 days or it, it just didn't make sense. And so... We kind of took we we kind of took a look at how companies like HashiCorp were selling to the industry. Um, you know, Blake is a big advocate of this, um, and and you know, Jeremy's a, a, obviously a, a fan of Blake and, and and the work that he's done. But you know, yeah. it was those really early days of you know CMD sales that we were looking at ways to, to actually get in front of customers and, and deliver some value, right? And yeah. and not be trying to be more than what we were. Like it was, hey, we're gonna make you look like a rock star. We're gonna be able to explain to your manager why this stuff's important. Mm -hmm. And not only that, the value for us wasn't making my life specifically easier. It was all the carry on effects. What do CIOs care about? They care about passing the SOC too. They care about passing PCI. They care about not getting popped at the end of the year. And for us, it was always about making sure that when we were solving a problem, we weren't just solving it for you, but we were making it way easier to tell your boss. So perfect example is this. How many times have, have we been asked 
um, look, uh, we need to roll that MFA for production and we're going to kind of explain to the auditor that because we're using certificates for the VPN and because we're using keys for SSH, there's two factors of authentication being used. So there's it's two factor, right? <laughs> or just roll out CMD, flip on duo. Cause you're already using it in the org. Your team's going to love it because it's going to work. Yeah. And we, we just wanted to try and move the needle that way. But, but Jeremy, I think one of the other components that we, we often don't think about here is what's time to value. Like, on a Friday afternoon when I'm trying to figure out how to pause that single line of my audit D log or figure out why it's pinning the CPU on this specific workload for some weird reason, I don't want to be figuring that out myself. I want to be enjoying a beer. You know, the, yeah. the, the intent for our, our, our approach is how can we simplify things knowing that everyone's using kind of the same stack. We can solve a lot of the problems early on. Um, and my engineering team have done a really good job of making sure it's super reliable. We save you time, we save you money in the long run. And, and I think we often don't value our own time as security practitioners. We want to spend 50 hours writing a fuzzer for this specific API endpoint in the product, or we pay $199 for burp suite and we pull a plug in off their store. Well, you'd write it yourself. But anyway. you kind of you kind of want to but but i think the the, the the play here is is to not necessarily just think about the immediate kind of value it's like yeah i can write it myself but yeah. what's the force multiplier in that my 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 approach to you is i solve the boring problems you want to tie cmd into an awesome slack multi-step process for approval awesome we'll let you do it build the stuff that you care about building don't worry about regex filtering bpf events coming off the system don't worry about filtering the stuff Riding to a bucket. Keep it so, are you saying that we should have like an alternative DEF CON session that says, <laughs> "How do you talk to a CIO slash CFO slash CISO?" Because yeah. I mean, really, this is an interesting point. Is that I mean, I have to tell you, I struggle sometimes because we go to people, and I won't mention companies that we've dealt with in the past because you sometimes you have to deal with idiots who really love their own solution, and you say, "Oh my yeah. God, you are so exposed." Oh, yet, how many custom shells have we seen? I, I, I've, but, God, it's right? terrifying. <laughs> and so it's, it's one of these things we found sometimes it's easier just to talk to numbers to the CISO and the CEO and just say, hey, it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even though no matter how good your tech is, right, those yeah. guys are making the decision. And it's really right. hard. I mean, they are. Yeah. We, and we look, always I mean, consider, yeah. In the end, you've got to think about different ways. Like what, what's the value proposition to the business? Well, not getting yeah. compromised. Cool. Every vendor says that. Uh, can That's I insure great. you yeah. against a, a $100,000 adversary? You know, I don't know. Who spends a hundred grand on popping a system? You just, you know, rubber hose attack still works, guys. Um, but the, I think the, the, the problem that, that's, that's come out of the last few years of cybersecurity and specifically cyber sec very large cybersecurity vendors is we've kind of lost touch with what it meant to work with a vendor. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, trusted vendors are great. Um, you know, the, the one thing I always pride ourselves on is we're, we're not perfect. We're a company that's growing. We want to learn from our customers. We want to learn weird things you want to do with the stuff that we're doing. That's why we give it away for free because people give us good feedback. But I think one of the biggest things that we've learned is when you're trying to explain value to, to leadership, you've got to do it in the context of your own environment. So why did Hootsuite use HashiCorp's products, right? You can see the public affiliation with them in the past and things like that, I've written a lot of blog posts on it. The reason we did it is because the stuff worked, right? And when the stuff works to a point, going to a CTO and saying, hey guys, uh, you know, we've, sent, we've saved you a lot of this time. You've got this solution rolled out and flipping this switch and this switch is going to get you this much more and actually address a lot of the higher level business concerns becomes a reality. And I think a lot of security vendors that don't let you play with the software, don't let you kick the tires, don't let you actually test the thing beyond a very gated POC that, oh yeah, we enable that in your paid version kind of gets you it kind of throws a bit of caution to the wind. You know, we, we rely on experts using systems to integrate those systems for us. And, you know, vendor relationships with companies have to be, you know, filled with integrity. If, if we're not going to do something, we tell customers we're not going to do it. If we're going to do it really well, because we think it's awesome, great. Hey, if we can hack together some awesome ways to, to prototype it, even better. But showing value to leadership is always difficult. And, and especially when leadership wants to spend money on the thing that sits in front of them all day. Right? No one thinks about the 4,500 Linux servers running in their cloud environment. They care about them when they get popped. Yeah. But they don't care up until then. And it's about being able to say, guys, this is a problem. Here's an easy way to visualize how much 
you know, people are logging in as root or how many shared account access points are there. It just simplifies it for you. You've got to convey value. Um, and I think that's a, it's a hard ask for a lot of folks. So are, are you seeing uh, any unique specific industry adoption for CMD for over others? Yeah, I, I think we, we look at highly targeted industries as being pretty, pretty excited about the tech. And, and usually this is going to come where financials are involved. So you, you look at any industry that is most attacked early on. You go way back to the, you know, the early 80s, kind of mid 80s when credit card systems were being used and fraudsters were tackling, uh, you know, how they were generating credit card numbers and looking at different ways to attack those systems. You go to where the cash is. And so a lot of our financial services companies that are using the software have found immense difficulty in defending against advanced adversaries, but also just being aware of what those adversaries are doing. There's no um, Verizon DBIR report that's going to tell you you've got to look for this specific, you know, exec chain or this specific sequence of events. And I think the hardest thing about it is those that are hit the hardest are usually pretty big enterprise companies. And so we've, we've definitely got a lot of those uh, on the docket. Where we've seen the most exciting adversarial kind of behavior is companies that actually manage healthcare or private care, you know, kind of private information around healthcare or, or patient information. Um, so you tend to see like healthcare or healthcare management systems, companies that have, you know, got, you know, some kind of compliance, some kind of sensitive information stored on their systems that's related to like personal data. Um, and I think that's really just kind of come together because of COVID and a lot of the work that's being happening around research. You're seeing more targets yeah. around organizations that may be doing research in those fields. But I think that the, the last and most probably underserved uh, demographic that we find really interesting attacks in uh, is SaaS. Um, SaaS businesses that have MSSP, right. like managed security providers or, um, you know, kind of security vendors right. or other vendors coming into the infrastructure. <laughs> the amount of times that we have seen people popped through their third party vendors is atrocious. I think the first engagement that we had, it was a POC engagement a couple of years ago. One of the very first engagements that we had with a managed vendor and a parent company relationship was like a little over 850 violations of policies in the first day. And they, 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 they sent me an email saying, Jake, turn the alerts off. Like, this is stupid. This thing is noisy beyond all belief. And I, I looked at the data thinking, Oh my God, I've, I've built horrible policies. These don't work. It's not going to scale. What have I done? And it actually turned out <laughs> that yeah. the, the MSP had outsourced their, their management of this fleet to another company, which was outsourced then again oh. to another organization. Oh. And the nested, the nested chain of failures was terrifying. And, and, and this is, you know, obviously it's a worst case scenario, but this is the kind of stuff that we're seeing out there. SaaS companies are about margins. They're about efficiency. They're about operability. Mm -hmm. All of us know that if you've let someone in your environment, you better trust what they're doing because when you don't, it's kind of a scary proposition. Well, and yeah, and that reminds me of the Target uh, POS attack where it was one of their suppliers, right, that got breached yep. really and then got that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, that's even like arm's length. Like I, I think that's probably, I think it was like an HVAC manufacturer that had an entry point to the network and then the network SOC team had plumbed it to the internet because they wanted to manage it remotely. That attack might have come from someone who didn't even know what an SSH key was, right? right. Like th th These are the level of kind of, adversarial sophistication that we're seeing, but you know, not to, not to, to kind of, um, bad amount that pattern. It's, it's really about validation, right? Like know where your risks are and, and be able to build, you know, co common ground between them. I think like Jeremy, you, you, you see this all the time. Probably a lot of the questions that you're asked are, are relating to how are you defending? How are you working with us to defend? Exactly. What are we doing? Where is the validation point? Where is the next step? And I, I think that's where it gets tricky. It's hard to kind of put the finger on it unless you're, are actually validating it and uh, i don't think a lot of us are it's kind of scary yeah so you know, go ahead you're a, you, you're a linux product yep is it a is, are you constrained to specific linux types or is it if i have any flavor of linux i can use cmd so it's a good question um we started building the product on like an N minus two N minus three and a minus four kind of pattern of thinking um and then we really realized that uh, no one patches their stuff, even when they say they do. <laughs> I think we're like <laughs> N minus 10 now. Um, 
we we tend to focus on distributions that are supported in uh, i just love chris's response there. Oh, we, tend to, we tend to look at um distributions that are supported by cloud vendors we have a like x86 64 requirement but we're pretty flexible with what we deploy to and build for but i think the most important thing to consider is really the age of the system does depend on the level of like integration we can have with that system like our minimum cutoff is like you've got tls enabled on the host uh, you have the ability to look at ways to to lock down the system through some kind of privileged, you know, kind of user mechanism. Um, but like directly speaking, it's generally compatible. And I, I, I'd taken this screenshot randomly and it was sitting in my Dropbox a couple of years ago of like just some, some kernel information. And uh, I was talking to a customer, actually, actually, Jeremy, I think this was uh, someone that we were speaking to in common, but I was talking to a customer and I, I'd noticed that it was the same kernel version. So I, I realized at that point in time, this has got to be from before 2013, 2012, maybe 2010. Like how, like how old is this system? <laughs> like I, I, I remember installing it from a CD at the time and thinking this thing is probably really out of date and I'm going to have to update it. And internet in Australia wasn't super fast. It still really isn't. But uh, I remember you know, the, the parallel to that is when IBM had OS two, yeah. Right, a lot of financial institutions would put OS two on, put their applications on, put it in a closet, and forget it because it wouldn't break. Yeah, right? it just kept going and going, and it never got <laughs> patched. Al, he Al he about, always has to plug OS two. Yeah, Al was about his Abacus, Abacus version two when the beads were changed from Jade. Oh, very nice, very nice. Uh, the, the, jade to, the jade to brass transition, I remember, was very, very controversial because the color tones were conflicting for colorblind oh. folks. So, you know, I remember it was a it was a controversial time. But, you know, at the same time, we talked about AIX, right? IBM it, it just briefed a recent report. Again, everybody says IBM bets the farm all the time. Well, they're saying now they bet the farm that Red Hat acquisition, right, with Linux is the future and that's where oh, yeah. they're going to drive a lot of their revenue stream from you know i think and why I think are they still building power nine power <laughs> chips right why are they still supporting aix7 if because that was really their if that was really their future then why aren't they actually pushing that in well, why do I, I have to run red hat on power that question. i can answer that question because i worked for ibm's power division at one time go yeah. ahead Al. there are a lot of major financial institutions that run AIX today and they will not get off of it because they have not found an alternative. They just had that thing in COBOL where New Jersey people were looking for more COBOL programmers because the, 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 the state was going downhill. They're probably on those power or whatever. X. <laughs> exactly. We've bought up AIX. It's power sixes, so it's power the, uh, sevens. You're on the We're graffiti up, now, huh? We've bought up the AIX plan, so I've actually switched to the disaster recovery now. There you go. <laughs> that's, that's how much you might have to call the wife to get another one. Keep on going. I'm hitting the bubble I, stash. <laughs> the bubble stash. I love it. <laughs> I think. Uh, I think that. I think the confusing thing, or at least the concerning thing for a lot of folks out there, is just like, when do they actually make that transition? Are they forced to make it? I, to be honest, I think COVID's pushed a lot of us that way. Uh, mm -hmm. We're talking to customers that have never spoken about cloud, never spoken about SaaS, never spoken about anything being managed by anyone else. Now talking about it. And look, that AIX system is going to have a COBOL developer doing something on it in a few years. Maybe right. where we can get to that point. Like, I, I don't even know. I, I, I think what's going to happen is we're going to see it taper towards more modern infrastructure. And look, you're right. The, the, the play that IBM is making is to, to, to bet, you know, to, to place bets on the future. It doesn't mean they're going to stop supporting legacy. If people want to pay for it, you know, there's, there's mm -hmm. like, it's a cash cow. There's a lot of systems here. Right? It's right. like, like that's cash yeah. cow still. Oh well, yeah. Every every healthcare customer yeah. of any sizable consequence running Epic, running McKesson, right? Maybe even <laughs> running some old <laughs> Siemens apps are running on <laughs> IBM power systems, right? That's right. They're, so, they're, it's all AIX, it's all legacy yeah. stuff. Now at the same so, time, IBM has taken their mainframes and they have built a system that is a Linux bolt on capability for that. Mm -hmm. Not AIX, but a Linux bolt on. Realizing yeah. that they've got to have that integration. How much of how much of this is really kind of just a, a paradigm of a, a, a fear, right? Like how how much of this is like if we're if we're staying with what we've got and the APIs aren't changing and the systems aren't changing, you know, it's not necessarily cost efficiency. Now it's like, is it security through obscurity? Is, is it mm -hmm. is it that CISOs and CIOs are now betting the fact that 
like anyone that compromises this thing is going to have to spend three years building a debugger for it because we don't even have oh. one, right? Like, <laughs> you know, I think <laughs> you can share a code. <laughs> A solid point. So, so vulnerability has a lot to do with how many hours a piece of code runs. Yeah. Right. And that as we increase functionality and increase code base for that functionality, we insert risk into the code base. Right. That if all if we were willing to live with with you know a version of a browser from 20 years ago, would be all good. Right. That's but good. as we increase capability, we increase risk. But but in my head, as we t we're talking and and, and what I realize is that now I'll call Al with a startup too, is, is that we're all used to building these startups from scratch. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I, I want to get away from talking about this to two, two, two really things that are going in the back of my head, which is the people around you right now, Jacob. Yeah. That, that I was just re, uh, reading, reading, like when you watch YouTube, I'm calling it reading in my head because I don't know. YouTube is around reading. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger talking about, I'm not a self-made man. It's a oh, great yeah. speech yeah. because yeah. it basically says that, and I agree with it, that everything I've accomplished in my life is because I've had the right people around me, right? Yeah. Now you have a staff around you. Oh yeah. And, 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 and you must love them. All right. I mean, we were just before this call, we, we decided to do a, a test and lo and behold, like, I hate to say it, we're, we're only a 10 person company. Everybody but two people was on our, our, our Zoom meeting discussing what was going on before this. We poor yeah. Al had to come over to this one. But I mean, so how, two things. One, I mean, how did you find the staff you have? Because yeah. to tell you the truth, I hate to say it, but, but our industry, and Jeremy, you can hide from this, is filled with posers. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. 15,000 people showing up to DEF CON and most of them don't even know how to turn on a Linux box. Yeah. Right. You know, spell DEF CON. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We go with this. Do you know why it's even called DEF CON? Now I'm going down a whole thing. You know why it's DEF CON is called DEF CON? Besides the DEF CON BBS and why it's in Vegas? Jeff Moss is a huge War Games fan. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's called DEF CON because of War Games. And yep. the first city to get nuked in War Games, Vegas. That's why the party is in Vegas. <laughs> because when BBS, when he was closing down his BBS, they said, where'd you want to meet? He's like, Vegas. It's the first place that gets nuked. And so, hence why DEF CON's in Vegas. But, awesome. uh, so as you're, you're hiring these people, there's two things that, that I find amazing. I mean, I, there's certain, certain people I have a lot of respect for. And, and you talk about device drivers. The code rookie Jason Wright is a great open BSD developer. Mm. Um, is they're not exactly, they don't have empathy for idiots, right? <laughs> Which is 99% of your customer base. And I'm not, not 99% of ours, our, our customer base is all intelligent, but 99% of the other customer base. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> not idiots. There's either Jason or either Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> talking about everybody else. <laughs> I, I, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying that... I, I kind of get what you mean. I, I, I right? think... You, you, if you're developing freaking Linux stuff, half yeah. the people, when they build a tarball and it doesn't work, they don't know why it doesn't work. They keep on reinstalling and recompiling and they're guessing and guessing and guessing of why this tarball is not installing. You know, I think, I think there's a really... Um, maybe this is the Australian talking to me. Um, but I, I think there's a very, um, there's a really strong kind of allergic reaction to, to, to learning. Um, and it, it it's okay to learn. Mm. Um, the, the one thing that I've always held as part of my career and growth into technology and then into cybersecurity was that there's always something to learn. Like we always have to be a hundred percent aware that there is someone better at doing the thing that we do day over day, week over week, month over month. And look, I, I, I get on the phone with some of our customers and I see them doing insane debugging on our product that I'm like, holy crap, you did that? That's awesome. But I, but I think that, you know, I'll, I'll answer the question in two parts and, and I'll get back to, to kind of what I was thinking on my, my kind of Australian heritage. Because you know you're going to be a very poor person if you only sell to smart people. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think I think I think we we have to as an industry make security more accessible. Why, why do we need yeah. to do that? Security needs to be more accessible because being on a high horse in the corner of the room in a dark, 
disconnected part of the office uh, being isolated doesn't win us any favors. And when you build security into the culture of a company through passion, yeah. through people that are in- excited and curious, you get people excited. Um, I'll, I'll talk about, you know, Bl- Jeremy mentioned Blake. Um, Blake's one of my, my sales, uh, sales guys. He was the first non-engineering hire at CMB. Um, he wasn't an, an incredibly deep technical security sales guy. Um, but within the space of around a year and a half, he, you know, stood up on stage at DEF CON and presented in the SECTF and actually did pretty well. Yep. And I think what it did to me, what it did for me is it demonstrated that it's okay to not be the best in your field, but to actually want to learn and, and, and contribute. Um, there's this, there's this really interesting kind of principle that I've always had. And I think, you know, I think it was talking to other Australian founders that have come to North America. The, the one thing that I've actually noticed, and it's, it's a conversation that I've had with my co-founder a couple of times is you, you constantly feel like the underdog, right? There's always someone better. I remember watching, um, you know, pit to the pit to the, I think it was pit to the, to the, the core room elevator kind of hacking in, in DEF CON back in the day. My first DEF CON was <laughs> DEF CON 21. Um, and I was there with a buddy, Nick, uh, he was going to AUVSI, which is a, a we, we, we've hit 21 already. <laughs> that, was a, that was a long time ago. <laughs> that was a long time but, ago. But, but the, the scary <laughs> thing about it was at that point, I had no idea what I didn't know. And, and the one thing I'll say is, there's, there's intrinsically, uh, you know, you've got a bit of a sixth sense for, for people that are, that are excited to learn. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say this, that the engineers that I've hired that are the most capable engineers at CMD are those that came into security through exploration, right? They came into security through cutting their teeth on, on figuring out how to configure that weird uh, Novell user group attribution problem all the way down to, hey, you know, just trying to pirate movies back in the day on weird chat groups and BBSs that, that they were talking about. I think the thing for me was training and educating people that come from other kind of worlds, come from other you know, kind of vantage points has been awesome. To answer your question more directly though, in, in Australia, I always felt like I was the underdog. I had no idea I was a good pen tester. Uh, you know, look, I, I like to think um, being one of the select few that's made five, six figures doing pen test work in the past, I, you know, bug bounty work, not just, you know, physically working for a pen test company, but bug bounty work that's pretty awesome, right? Like, you know, kind of hearing and meeting folks from HackerOne and Bug Crowd at these events, like actually found out that I was okay at it, but I always felt that there was someone better and it was okay, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think that na- natural kind of creative underdog nature always gave me the drive to do more. I look for people that want to do more. Um, there's, wow. a, there's a really great uh, video that actually got shared with me by my, my head of CS. Um, and it was a couple of, it was a couple of weeks ago, but he was, he was sharing this video from, I think it was Shopify and it was, we look for people that draw owls. And, um, I don't know if you've, you've ever seen the meme <laughs> of like step one is draw two circles. Step two is draw the fucking owl. <laughs> find people, find people that are going to fill in the gaps. Security people boobies. fill in the gaps. <laughs> the, the two circles have to be owls. Okay. I think that, I think that, you know, what I'm trying to say is it's super important to find people that have areas of expertise outside of your own to really yeah. grow a diverse team. I mean, so sure. this brings a really interesting conversation. So hiring people and finding good people. So, yeah. so this is, this is one of these things. So I'll tell you our favorite interview question. Tell me the last book you read. Yeah. It's, it's a fascinating question because, because yeah. you actually have to read the damn book. So this is something <laughs> that, that the person really loves, right? My, it, my, question is, my question is, can you tell me a little bit about your home network? Can you tell me a bit about That's another good one too, right? Which, I, we, I we, always, that's on our list too, which is what machine, what system do you run at home? And yeah. when the guy's saying, well, I got my regular machine and I have my lab. <laughs> right? if, they, if they say the word lab and I'll, I'll maybe kind of put a bit of a shout out to Jeff Welling, who has probably the coolest sounding lab. I haven't seen it. Yeah. I've seen some, some glimpses of it on Zoom, but I know it's like a whole pile of systems in one of his rooms. But, um, I, you know, like little things like this. Um, I have uh, 10 gig fiber in my house that's coming to this access point. I've got uh, gigabit to the output 
outside world and it's awesome and I've swapped out the media converter and I've done other things to, to get a little bit extra out of the connection. My wife doesn't care at all about it, but she knows that she can stream movies really fast and it generally stays online, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, the, the funny thing about it is when you ask people about what they're passionate about, they'll lean in and they'll say, do I have a story to tell you? Right. So it, that's do, another one. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Are- yeah. It doesn't matter if they're, they're passionate passion. about mountain bikes or, 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 you know, kind of malware. It's, it's, it's about being passionate, being a subject yeah, matter expert and, and wanting to lean in. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a big lean in on the right. things that they want to learn. Right. I mean, we believe in passion. I mean, that's, that's the one we most love the most. Hey, Jeremy, I mean, I hate to change you. We're really just talking to Jacob, but man, what's your, what's your interview question? Do you have an interview <sighs> question? No, I, you know what's interesting? I don't ask about the book. Do you say like, are you going to watch my car after the interview? Is that like? <laughs> no, no, no. It's 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 like um, my my go to stumper is is where where do you see yourself in five years? Yeah, yeah, that's right. a it's a, high that's question a terrible one. Time. Really, you do that one to people, people? I do, and I, I do that because I want to see how ambitious they are. Do they have the does like he said? Do they have the desire to go from being a sock analyst one to a sock analyst two to a sock analyst three. Do they want to be a threat hunter? Do they want to be an account manager? What is their passion? Right. And then as, as, as the, as the leader, we you know we have to, we have to push them into that, into that space and give them the tools to learn if we just choose to hire them. But, you know, you can't ask them what's your favorite strain. That's politically incorrect or HR incorrect. Right. <laughs> Hey, you know, Maybe, what's correct. your favorite IPA? Maybe yeah. that's a question we ask now. That is an acceptable one. I'll tell you the one that went well. Yeah, go on, Jacob. Well, I, think one of the, I think one of the things that we've always got to keep in mind is what's the objective, right? When we hire people, we've got to think of, you know, what are we going to add to their career? What are we going to add to their life to, sure. to, to, to grow them as an individual into something that is going to be awesome when they go to the next company? Right. You'd be very good in one of those, those startup therapy places. Jay. Yeah. Really <laughs> you know, I think, I think, I think maybe what it comes from and, and, and kind of going back to the comment on, on customers, thinking about the persona, thinking about the kind of people that use your platform, use your product, use your technology, who the, who the end user is, what are you doing? How are you going to relate to that person? Why, why do I focus on, you know, who, who my team relates to? Cause they relate to our customers, the geeks, they, they love that's, the deck on, they, that's the whole they reason go why to different things. That. And, and, right? and I think, I think, you know, if I'm not hiring people that want to do the things that I want to do, that want to socialize in ways I want to socialize, that want to talk in ways I want to talk, think creatively, think outside the box, um, draw the owl, right? You know, we've got to, right. we've really got to kind of think about literal in, interpretation of a problem versus, versus anything else. But I think gatekeeping and security is a problem. We need to do something about it. We, we absolutely need to do something about it. And look, I, I like to think that I've, I've given a lot of people kickstarts into security. I think I've, I've um, provided opportunities for those who have wanted to lean into cybersecurity in great ways. And look, it's, it's all of our responsibility to do that. When we think about what gets someone excited about looking at adversaries digitally attacking systems, it's a weird thing, guys. Like, I, I don't know, my grandfather and my, you know, my grandmother, when I, when I said I was studying cybersecurity, when I studied, I, look, my, the, the course that I actually studied in Australia was called Cyber Forensics Information Security Management. And everyone kind of looked at me like, what do you, what's cyber forensics? And today I think it's, it's standard nomenclature. Like people get it. But I, think I think about ways that got us in <laughs> I think, uh, you know, let, you know? So let's take and swing the pendulum now. So yeah. we've got these younger folks that you're hiring into the companies, you swing that pendulum over and now you got folks that are at the end of their careers like myself. I think, I think there is Sorry. A, a, a substantial personal responsibility to mentor. Oh, hundred percent. I think if we're not teaching someone or working with someone to, to learn ourselves, um, like we're constantly learning we're humans, right? Uh, one of my family members recently retired and he has started beekeeping. Uh, he started gardening and he shared an Instagram post a couple of weeks ago of his gardening mentor and he's growing vegetables on our family farm and doing all kinds of amazing things. And I think what became really awesome about that is he's at the end of his career, he's retired, he's beekeeping and doing gardening. 
awesome. Like when, when we think about it, it seems so easy, but it's actually really complicated. Mm-hmm. I have no idea about the first thing other than the fact that, you know, I, Jacob, you, you I have reached out to him for some honey. <laughs> Al's got a ranch. We'll fly you down there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm keen to learn, mate. I, I think, I think if we're not curious, we're not, we're not, we're not picking things up. And, and look, the, the one thing for me, I, I, I spent a bit of time um, at Hootsuite vetting and, and kind of validating a lot of the, the internal bug bounty reports that we got when I first started, it was going through this inbox of security at and thinking, my God, what are all these vulnerability classes? I learned more from researchers that were submitting things off the cuff from bots and scripts and things that they'd scraped and built out in my security journey that have given me really great building blocks to learn as I built my own company. Right. I think the more we learn from that, that the, the better we're going to get at it. But look, we've all got a different take. We've all got a different life story. We've all got to learn different ways. Um, yep. My hope is that we can make it easier for folks that are trying to figure out Linux. Um, so they don't need to learn Redigex like I did with George. <laughs> that, one, that one line of George was pretty good and we still use it today. <laughs> to recovery planning for sure. <laughs> so I think that... I was going to say, you know, getting back to what does CM do, do for its customer? How... How do you see yourself if you if you come up and if you're going what is your objection handling? I've got SC Linux, I've got Splunk, I've got you have SC Linux? I've got Yeah, shut up. I've got uh, <laughs> you know, insert your thing here. I've got CyberArk or I've got Psychotic, I've got these PAM systems that are supposed to be managing and monitoring what I'm doing. Why do I need CMD? Yeah. Right? Um, how do you how do you handle those objections? You know, it's a, it's a really good question. I like, I like to look at built for purpose versus built for generic kind of solutions. Um, but I, I'll maybe kind of bring up the first point that we talked about. Product expertise is really difficult to get right. And a journey around crawling, walking, and running when it comes to security is the only way to really approach it, right? Mm-hmm. So what we're finding is that, you look, you've talked about a lot of shelfware. I'm not going to call out anyone specific, but you've talked about a lot of shelfware. And the reason it is shelfware is it's really hard to deploy at scale, right? It's easy for five servers. It's easy for one part of your org. But when you're actually rolling out a change to who can do what and where they can do it and why, people get a bit anxious, right? There's there's a lot of anxiety that's built up internally. So first and foremost, we handle objections on this front pretty easily. Um, We're talking to teams that want to deploy a security solution. They're not looking at the things that IT purchased 10 years ago. They're not looking at the thing that renewed last year because they had to renew it. They're looking at solutions that are going to solve problems for them. And we're solving the stuff that you care about. I'd love to say that we're doing APT crazy detection and evasion, but we're solving the simple things, the basic hygiene that you're going to need to solve. And if we can do that easily, great. Talking about some of the custom solutions though, and this is where we get a lot of combat. Um, especially from companies that have spent a lot of time investing in technology. The one thing I'd say for security leaders that are listening, and especially those that have, um, you know, kind of the, the, the approach of looking at how they scale their business moving forward, we've got to have a disaster recovery plan. And then we've got to have a secondary disaster recovery plan. <laughs> and the thought process behind it is making sure that when we go through the process of figuring out where our gaps are, we can't tie solutions to individuals. We've all seen this. We've got a production outage. That one engineer that understands that system innately, who's managed that system, deployed the system for five years, is out. They're out of range, they're out of reception, they're out of coverage, and we can't solve the problem. For us, it's about making sure that there is a simple approach to solving that problem and being the trusted vendor that's going to be there. What I've often seen is we rely on very sophisticated solutions to do serious things for our business. You called SE SE Linux out. We've had team members actually run workshops on SE Linux, looking at ways that you can configure it, set it up in your environment. But the amount of times I've come into a company and have said, look, we're going to have to look at putting SE Linux in monitor mode or put it in a mode where we can flag and enable and it's just completely turned off is terrifying. The -hmm. reason that is the case is because the subject matter expertise required to manage those systems is insane. And when I think about it, if we're tying solutions to people, we've got a single point of failure, right? Let's have a disaster recovery plan. What happens when the person that le- leaves, right? The manager's SC Linux for us leaves. What, what happens when I'm not able to tune my set comp policy for my containers next month because that person's out of the office? Or what happens when production is down 
and I'm faced with the reality of disabling security controls internally not entirely versus actually just fixing the problem that there, there in lines, the kind of binary pulp, you know, kind of principles that we face and, and, and it sucks, but it, it's a fact of life. I, I hate to say that we're, we're at a point in, um, in our, in our kind of security life cycle, uh, as a company at CMD, where we don't have single points of failure in, in, in some of the systems we put in place. We've been improving it. Like every company, there's always that one developer that knows that system better. You can write documentation around it, but the more you transfer that risk, the better you're actually going to be paying it off. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'd also say try and enable teams to, to grow, right? Give people the ability to become masters in systems that are built upon industry best practices because you're going to learn more right? Like, look, we're going to have a better vantage point about the healthcare industry or financial services or SaaS than many other security companies. Cause we look at the, the activity of admins every day. The amount of times I've heard people say no one has access to prod cause we turned off SSH. What about IPMI? Right. What, what, what about, uh, what about cloud SSH? What about SSM? What about uh, the entry point for your container system that's running through an API and a web, in a web interface? What about the yeah. fact that five of your devs have shipped SSH keys to different services as part of your CI CD pushes because prod is down and the CI, the CIO, the CTO is screaming at you. Think about ways to minimize that. Don't do that, Al. You don't push any <laughs> keys or anything. It's never in Git, even though it's a private Git. Never. I hear it. Uh, so- so, Jake, as we start winding down, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm going to ask a question that we could probably talk for another two hours on. Uh, <laughs> I, okay, I see Chris's uh, triple backup plan it's, there. It's, 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 it's a, you know, this is, I'm not a huge sour fan. My wife likes watermelon, so I did a, with a watermelon three notch, and uh, it, it wakes you up. <laughs> I've been drinking IPA every day, all of a sudden I get a yeah. freaking sour. I, and Chris I've got to say that. Likes it sour. I gotta say the Parkside is really good. It's uh, it's, the Parkside. So I gotta go to Vancouver for that one. You you probably do. Um, you know, if uh, if any listeners are up here, make sure you kind of take one of those river cruises and test it out, right? (laughs) Maybe maybe not. I think I think the board is closed right now, so you're probably gonna have to get someone to. To kind of uh, ship it over with them. <laughs> you have to go to the Fortify headquarters and they can throw them across the border to us. Look, so, uh, I'm sure we can build some kind of cannon to get them over. So as we wind down, Jake, um, just, just give me a couple of thoughts on directionally uh, where you're going. And then yeah. secondly, do you see this whole effort? And in, in, we're seeing a lot of people you know, use it as a buzzword necessarily, not not uh, necessarily that it's totally ingrained within their security culture, but this notion of the uh, MITRE attack models, right? Yeah. Wow. Um, I have been part Bring of that at the, the end, uh, Al. You yeah. Put that at the end. It's like a freaking <laughs> its own. Like, like I said, own conversation. Power dialogue, I, but I'm asking those... Jake to put it in two sentences or less, right? Yeah, we do it. Oh, Check. We're done. Okay, for those that want to see how CMD works with MITRE ATT&CK, we were part of the, I, I want to say the very first summit for MITRE ATT&CK, Freddie Duzua, the team, Rich Strauss, and the crew at Circle U quite a few years ago, three or four years ago. It was a room of 40 people who were working on MITRE ATT&CK many, many years ago, and we demonstrated the first implementation of TTPs for Linux um that 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 was kind of out there uh, in general from a preventative standpoint policies that didn't existed florian roth had built this amazing uh, framework around detection but we worked on prevention and it was one of those incredible moments in my career where i was like i feel like i'm on the cusp of this incredible standard like this incredible new motion in security and sure enough, the most recent summit that they did was, I, I think, three or 400 people. Um, it mm-hmm. was incredibly diverse, all kinds of software out there. There's dozens and dozens of Linux products out there. But what I will say is, you know, we, we adopted a lot of the policies, the procedures that, that, that the team at MITRE had implemented. We just did it from a preventative mechanism. And it was so cool to see that kind of that stuff come in. But I, I will say this, um, where I see a lot of detection capabilities going is very similar to what we saw with endpoint. I like to see Linux and cloud being kind of 20, 25 years behind from an adversarial complexity standpoint. We're looking at windows now and we're seeing binary substitution and DLL substitution. But what we're finding Mm -hmm. is that all of those adversaries that are tackling these environments are doing amazing things 
to just get that entry point, to just get to privilege, to just get to domain admin. You know, they're using awesome tools like Mimikatz to get across networks and, you know, pass the hash and do all kinds of cool stuff. And what we're finding is because they've got experience in these advanced tactics and techniques for Windows, in Linux, they're going to get to that kind of point of complexity much, much faster. So what our mm -hmm. job is at CMD is to learn what normal is, right? Our ability to be able to behaviorally categorize what users are doing, baseline in a better way so we can tell people when we see things going horribly wrong and encompass uh, a point of observability that doesn't rely on things like SSH or SSM or, you know, cloud shell or whatever, because the transport layer is going to change. We have to build ways to actually defend systems that are going to change over time. Yeah, so for me, know. it's about gaining as much observability as we can and building models and a historical trend over time to actually learn what we can yeah. what's going on in these I see why Jeremy likes you yeah because I mean <laughs> we, we, we've been talking about this for a long time that we feel like listen signatures are good but the problem is you need to know about it you're reputation, right you're... everybody does reputation Al how many hacks in the last three three weeks have we seen every single one of them bypass reputation reputation is like a sieve now because yeah. they know it exists yeah right I mean so look it, behavior yeah, we've got to consider that identity and actual like physical identity, the ability oh. to attribute that I am who I say I am and I'm about to do a thing that's sensitive and you should trust me as this person to do that thing has to be something we consider. I think one of the biggest challenges that we're always finding in security is how do we create as little ripples as we can in the pool while still getting in? Like we need to be involved in the process. Let's observe, let's monitor, and then let's act. But we need to realize that it's going to ramp from a sophistication standpoint far faster than it ever did on the Windows side because we cut our teeth on Windows, right? We cut our teeth on endpoint. We cut our teeth on, cut, cut our teeth kind of figuring out how we're going to actually get into an environment. Uh, and look, Jeremy, you, you see this all the time, man. It's like it, there's, there's a thousand and one sophisticated attacks. There's a thousand and one sophisticated mechanisms. How many are being used for Linux and Unix? Probably not many. Um, because you don't have to. No one's watching. No one's no one's watching. Um, it was it was really yeah, funny to demonstrate blocks. We're definitely seeing it now. We see we see more against the, the Linux than we normally did, and I think that you're in the mm -hmm. right spot, Jacob. I really do. I think that I'm glad we have this conversation. Um, you know, we're big believers in it. Al, obviously, if it was if it's not OS two, it's Linux. So he he believes in it too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jeremy, I mean. But but what I what I like is is that listen you've got a very technical solution, yeah. And obviously yes. you have a good team around you, and and that team represents your product. I mean, remember how much code you write. The essence of that code is your team, right? Yeah, distilled us, distilled yeah. down. You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a. I think uh, I think most of the code that I've written is out of the system, which is a good thing. <laughs> oh, but it got it going. I mean. I hate to tell you every time I do something with interface and but Quinn who runs our product side won't let me do it during the weekdays. So on the weekends I become a coder. Yeah. The only yeah. time he lets me touch code is because, because he can't say don't do it because it's the weekend. Mike, uh, <laughs> Mike, my CT, uh, Mike, my CTO has always had this uh, strong approach of saying, Jake, you're, you're like a sledgehammer with the code that you write at <laughs> the failure cases. But I will say this, it, it gets it done. It gets it done right. And much like every security engineer, you, you, you learn by kind of, uh, you learn by doing, I, I mean, I, I, I learned by building automation into my, you know, home theater system originally in Australia and figuring out the details around that. Like we all figure out our own ways and, and Hey, Code is code, right? It's uh, code is ones, awesome. ones, ones, ones and zeros are going to work. No, <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I think my, my engineering team is, uh, you're exactly right when you say it, Chris. I, I think when you think about the, the, the pieces of the puzzle that kind of add up to build something great, uh, what it takes is, is actually trying to solve a problem. I don't want to try and solve problems that you don't have. I want to try, try and solve problems that you do. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's boring. Sometimes my team thinks it's boring to solve those problems, but unfortunately, the things that we all got to do, it's duplication of effort, duplication of code. Cool. You can do it with free. Yeah. Definitely. And, and, and the beauty is, is that once it's code, somebody else can, can access it and mm. gain that knowledge. And I think that that's the beauty of our industry. And I, I think that you're probably the first conversation we've done like 10 of these is the first conversation where we're obviously not only you're technical, but you got technical people behind you. Otherwise, you oh, yeah. can do work and bitching. 
You're not bitching, so obviously uh, people do the work. I, uh, yeah, look, I, I think, um, I, I think if you're, if you, you know, a lot of, a lot of security founders, and and I, I, look, I've been, I've been privy to some amazing kind of security founder groups and and look we're we've got amazing advisory and, and amazing investors that have had have, allow, have allowed me to be technical for a long time in the company you're like a nascar driver so you you get a good thing, uh. <laughs> i like i like to think of a kind of like a you know like a like a motocross rider you know everyone's <laughs> kind of tinkering and tweaking on the weekends um i gotta i gotta take, i gotta take jake <laughs> <laughs> but but I, but I will I will say this uh, you know it, it's all about the team um, you know I, I I think for for the last number of years we've really built an amazing crew at CMD we've we've grown pretty 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 in a, in a pretty awesome way um, we've kept our technical integrity we haven't diverged from what we originally kind of set out to do which was make Linux security easier. We learned a lot, um, but we're not pretending that we, we know everything. And, and look, I, I mean, the, the one thing that I encourage is, is look, if, uh, if, if folks have a way for us to detect something, look at something cool, let us know. Uh, we're, we're always oh. learning. We're always interested. All right. Well, so I got two things then before we finish, before Al, before Al closes us out. Yeah, actually, is, yo, his bladder is dying. Go yeah, on. Bye, old man prostate. <laughs> uh, the underneath first the thing. Table. <laughs> the first thing is for all of our listeners, we want you to go to cmd.com forward slash BNB yep. and register for a free, uh, for the CMD free product and just try it. Kick the tires. It's not going to cost you anything. You get a couple of licenses to put in your environment. It's super simple to put in. It's very easy to use. It's you're going to enjoy it. The second thing is, Hey, Elon, return my phone call. This guy's going to protect your Tesla. Okay? Stop evading aye, me. Aye, aye. Uh, that's going to be a fun one. I, I will say Martin on my engineering team does have in-car experience, so we're, uh, we're ready when you are. There you go. Right. Elon, I know you're listening. You're, our, you're a regular subscriber. So with that, we're going to start winding down and, and say, Jake, thank you. thank you. It's been a real pleasure to meet you and to talk with you. And, yeah, and listen, you. quite honestly, I'm excited about how we can collaborate and move forward together between the, the three teams here. I think yeah. it, it just help accelerate, you know, the notion that Linux is a critical area. There's a lot of just critical applications running on it today that must and need to have a, a security posture that's, that's enhanced from where it is. 100%. No, I, I entirely agree with you.